Garrison Keillor is perhaps the country's most beloved Midwesterner. For 40 years, he has hosted the radio program A Prairie Home Companion each Saturday night. Its mix of music, humor, and homespun erudition reaches four million listeners on 590 stations. He's also host of The Writer's Almanac, a daily five-minute program on public radio featuring literary facts of interest and a poem. He's here this evening to share poems with us from Oh, What a Luxury versus lyrical, vulgar, pathetic, and profound, his first collection of original poetry. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Garrison Keillor. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be in your city. I, I mean, I would say that no matter what city I was, <laughs> I was in. But in your case, you know that it's true. <laughs> you know that it's true. 30 years ago, I was in love with a girl who lived on Judah in the inner sunset. And uh, I was so crazy about her, and everything about her was absolutely absolutely perfect. She came out to visit me in Minnesota in November, and uh, she realized that wasn't going to work. And uh, I had already started a Prairie Home Companion. I was 10 years into it. I couldn't give it up. I couldn't move it. And um, so, but when you've been in love in a city, Every time you come back to the city, you feel the same feelings, even though there's no object of your love there anymore. And, um, and so that's how I feel coming back to San Francisco. I remember now that I wrote about her in this book, probably more than once. Um, she was memorable. I wrote, she lived in San Francisco in the cool Pacific mists where she danced all night to disco with the other hedonists. <laughs> a life of ease and sushi, and yet she felt depressed. And one afternoon at two, she took a plane to the Midwest. She came to Minnesota following the North Star and bought a farm and wrote a very meaningful memoir full of visionary zeal and unity and all, the beauties of the prairie and the city of St. Paul. Wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> Never happened. And she hated disco, but, but what could you do? She always took me over to the park and we walked around there and uh, I wrote this poem about it years, years later when I came back and uh, did a Prairie Home Companion at the Opera House. A foggy January day in Golden Gate Park, blessed and beatific, 62 degrees under the eucalyptus trees beside the Pacific, the fragrance of cypress and Monterey pine, magnolia in bloom giving off magnolia perfume and cherry blossoms and lotuses, or lota, a teenage couple making out in a Chinese pagoda <laughs> who stop suddenly as Asian grannies walk in, talking high-speed Mandarin. <laughs> An old man does Tai Chi by the sidewalk by Stowe Lake with rowboats lined up by the dock, turtles sitting on rocks in the sun, old ladies on a bench knitting, Everyone, Strawberry Hill, a steep climb to a view of the city and its hills and clouds like fields of white daffodils, a view that awakens the senses like a cosmic reveille, though you are breathing heavily. And you turn and see on the western horizon. Could it be? It can't, but it is. Bison. Several of them grazing in a field and beyond the setting sun, like a pink and orange vision 
of pure joy. No wonder people from Indiana, Ohio, North Dakota, and Illinois come here to awaken their old romance in a park of flowering plants under a Pacific sky. How could one not be in love, even if you're not sure with whom or why? <laughs> so that's what brings a person back, is an old romance. It's so sweet. And now I live on a street in St. Paul, Minnesota, a street of uh, big old Victorian and pre-Victorian uh, mansions, a lot of stone, a lot of brick, and, uh, and then a few wooden houses like mine. It's a romantic old sort of Edwardian street. And every evening around sunset, you see young people from another neighborhood walking past our house, holding hands, clutching each other, young people in their early 20s, couples in love. And that's what distinguishes our street, in my mind, is not the, the grandeur of the houses or, or the social position of the people who live there, as if that mattered anymore. What distinguishes it are these young couples walking along. And they look at our houses and they, and they imagine a life of grandeur for themselves. And God bless them. And now it's their turn. Here on an autumn night, in the grass and the dry leaf smell, drunk on the crickets and the starry sky, what lovely stories we could tell with all these bright lights to tell them by. An autumn night, and you and paradise so lovely and so full of grace. I see the lights reflected in your eyes. I reach out my hand and touch your face. I believe in impulse and all that is green Believe in the foolish vision that comes true. Believe that all that is essential is unseen. And for this lifetime, I believe in you. All of the lovers and the love they made, nothing that was between them was a mistake. All that we did for love's sake was not wasted and will never fade. All who have loved shall be forever young and walk in grandeur on an autumn night along the avenue. They live in every song that's sung, in every painting of pure light, in every pas de deux. Love that shines from every star, love reflected in the silver moon. It is not here, but it's not far, not yet, but it will be here soon. Well, this is not really a book of love poems. I put in a few, but one only needs to write so many love poems. How many people can you be in love with, after all? <laughs> so there are a few in there. Mostly, I've gone back to writing the poems that I loved when I was a child. Sometimes your instincts are right when you're eight, nine, ten years old. And then they try to educate you away from that. And after you've struggled with these false lessons they've taught you, then you go back to what you, to what you remember. My earliest memory as a child, one of my earliest memories of pleasure is to sit in our living room in Minnesota on a Saturday night in winter when my great uncle Lou would come and hold forth he could talk for hours. He could talk and talk. And everything that he said was something that he had seen or had happened to him or he had heard from reliable sources. <laughs> Politics didn't interest him. He wasn't a preachy person. 
He didn't give speeches. He only talked about what he had seen. He was probably the most sociable person in our family because he was a salesman. He sold candy. He sold sugar wafers and peanut brittle. And he traveled all around the city. And for that reason, he had to get along with strangers, unlike the rest of us who were sanctified brethren. And we were fundamentalists, and we looked down on other people ferociously <laughs> because we didn't need to sell them anything. <laughs> I, come from, I come from farmers. And, um, and so it was possible for us, you see, to have contempt for, 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 for the pagans and the infidels and the, and the unbelievers. And we did, and we did, uh, until I was 18, and then I got loose from it. But all the time, all the time I was growing up, I loved limericks. I just tremendously loved limericks. There was a young girl in Madras who had a remarkable ass. <laughs> Not soft, round, and pink, as you probably think, but the kind with long ears that eats grass. I loved... <laughs> I loved the, the rhythm of the, of the limerick. And as children, as children will, I loved absolute rules, things that were un bendable. You had to follow the rules of a limerick. You have two lines of three beats and two lines of, of, of two beats and one line of three beats rhymed A-A-B-B-A. -B -B -A, and that's a limerick. And you cannot add a skosh or a jot or a tittle or an iota. <laughs> that's a limerick. I used to do avant-garde dance with a blowtorch, blue paint, and no pants, <laughs> which some people guessed was genius, and the rest left quickly when given the chance. <laughs> there once was an old Democrat who loved to talk through his hat Oh, the smart things he said off the top of his head or else out the place where he sat. <laughs> A Republican lady of Knoxville bought her brassiers by the boxful, which she stuffed with corn kernels and old Wall Street journals to keep the fronts of her frocks full. Here's to the great Marcel Proust, whose novels often are used to keep a door shut or put under the butt to give a short person a boost. <laughs> it's like a puzzle. You're working within very, very narrow bounds here. And, uh, and, uh, and with Proust, you know, there are only are a few rhymes that are really going to amount to anything for you. And so there's a feeling of triumph when you are able to work out this puzzle and, and make it all fit metrically and put the punchline in the, in, in the last line where it should go. A vegan with nothing to do picked up a sandwich to chew. He took a big bite and cried out in fright, OMG, WTF, BBQ. <laughs> it's not a distinguished thing to be doing at the, uh, <laughs> at the age of 70. Uh, and... Uh, and I'm not proud of it, but uh, but it's uh, but it, but it's sort of I've come full full circle, you see. I mean, I tried, I tried. I, I had I had ambitions to be a serious a serious poet um, when I was in when I was in college. Um, I didn't much care for uh, the serious poems that were thrust upon us in high school. Uh, J. Alfred Prufrock and um, 
the man full of anxiety about whether to wear his trousers rolled or whether to eat a peach. And in the, in the room, the women come and go talking to Michelangelo. I, it, it didn't appeal to me uh, very much, but you know, I, 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 wrote a, I wrote an adulatory term paper about it as, you know, as an English major is able to do. And, uh, and, um, and Frost's poem, I, I, didn't, I didn't much care for. Uh, it was the most famous poem in America, probably for, for in, the, in the 20th century. Uh, whose woods these are, I think I know his house is in the village, though he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. It just didn't make a lot of sense. Um, stopping to watch snow <laughs> fall. In Minnesota, no. You, <laughs> you keep going when it's snowing. <laughs> you know, hang out and watch snow as if, I mean, maybe in Florida you would, but <laughs> not in Minnesota. And, and so the the heroic last lines of this poem that were quoted by a whole generation of politicians, you know, as, 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 something, as something remarkable and heroic. Uh, uh, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. Heroic, I don't know. Yeah. Why did you stop and better get going? <laughs> Wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, and the other famous poem, the most famous poem in America, made famous in this very city, thanks to the good offices of the San Francisco police uh, who arrested Ginsburg and, uh, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti and put them on trial for obscenity, uh, an enormous favor that was done uh, to them that I'm afraid the San Francisco police are, are not about to bestow on any other poet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you see anybody coming in through the door, let me know, and I've got, I'll, I've got poems I could recite here, but <laughs> just don't see it's going to happen again. I've seen the best minds of my generation uh, destroyed by madness. Well, I hadn't seen the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. Many of them became engineers. <laughs> And, 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 and designed useful things. Uh, I, I, I didn't follow that poem. Howell, to me, while a literary landmark, was also an unreadable poem <laughs> because Allen Ginsberg believed first thought, best thought. <laughs> he never revised anything. And that makes his collected poems similar to other people's wastebaskets. <laughs> Harsh words, I know, one should not speak ill of the dead. And, uh, and he was a very sweet and generous man. He was on a Prairie Home Companion once reading Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. And he had the most beautiful, the most beautiful reading voice ever. Allen Ginsberg, rest in peace. No, I, I, I had ambitions uh, of, of being a serious poet when I was, when I was in college. I, I imagine sometimes dying young uh, and becoming immortal, you know, the way a, a real artist should, uh, <laughs> as Buddy Holly did and as Janis Joplin did and, uh, and James Dean. Uh, two of them in California. I thought about that, and I could imagine people mourning for me and um, placing flowers on my grave and, uh, and uh, grieving that I had died before I could bring my enormous, complicated talent uh, under control. Uh, <laughs> But I wasn't that sure that I had an enormous complicated talent <laughs> or even a small simple talent. Uh, other people thought so because 
because I was kind of standoffish and I, and I didn't make eye contact and, and I tend to stay off by myself. Nowadays, they would say high functioning end of the autism spectrum. <laughs> But back then, they interpreted oddity in a different way, you see, as, as, as concealing some sort of gift, possibly. And, and they, they, they hoped for that. There was more hope uh, back, back then. What was then seen as an aspect of personality now is seen as a, as a clinical uh, condition, a syndrome with, with uh, an acronym, you know, usually beginning with the letter A. And uh, so I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure. I, I tried writing sort of surrealistic, uh, disconnected poems about my own sufferings and being lonely and misunderstood and so forth. Um, but they weren't really very satisfying because I had been brought up by people who loved rhymed verse. And so free verse didn't have a musicality to it that we, 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 we were forced to memorize uh, Shakespeare's sonnets in, in high school. And when you, when you have memorized, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and think upon myself and curse my fate, you have this for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's in your head, this beautiful thing is in your head. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. It's there forever, forever. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough. It stands along the woodland ride wearing white for Easter tide. You will remember this to your dying day. And if you should have a little cerebral incident, you know, and you feel kind of vague and disconnected, if you can remember, twas many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee, and this maiden lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me, then you're okay. You're basically <laughs> okay. All of the algebra that I learned in high school, the trigonometry, the physics, the chemistry, the plane geometry, it's all gone. <laughs> there isn't any, any of it left. A person can live a pleasant adult life in America without mathematics. The history that they taught me was, you know, in large part wrong, so that doesn't matter, <laughs> but, but uh, almost all of it is gone, gone, except for when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. A very lovely poem to know in all sorts of situations. I had these ambitions when I went off to college, but I did feel that to be a serious poet, you needed to have suffered a terrible wound back in your early years. The model for this was John Berman, who was a brilliant professor at the University of Minnesota when I was there, and who was widely admired and even more widely feared by, by us undergraduates with literary aspirations. John Berriman was a man who often gave public readings of his dream songs at the university. And when he did, he stood behind a lectern 
and he leaned heavily on it and sometimes looked as if he might fall off to one side. He was two sheets to the wind. He was a teacher in an English department that was the most alcoholic in America <laughs> and proud of it and, uh, and, and, and a chain smoker, as all of us were. It was, it was a requirement if you, if you were a serious writer or had ambitions that you, that you smoked at least two, maybe three or four packs of unfiltered cigarettes every single day. And you were never seen uh, playing games or taking physical exercise. It just was not done. And you learned how to consume uh, enormous amounts of, of, uh, of liquor. So there he was at the lectern, his voice, his speech slurred and, 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 and muttering non sequiturs to left and right as he read his poems. And we all knew his story, his tragedy. When he was 12 years old, his father had committed suicide with a shotgun in the yard of the family home under the boy's bedroom, whereupon the boy's mother married the man she had been having an affair with, which was one of the factors in the suicide. So that was, there was his there was his wound, and, and here he was, and his genius and his disability seemed entwined together, inseparable. You could not possibly imagine putting this man through therapy. <laughs> therapy would have destroyed his genius. We believed that. We believed that. It was all tied together. He, he came at the end of a whole generation of deeply, profoundly alcoholic American writers. And so there it was, a model uh, for, for the rest of us. Well, I didn't have a tragedy like that in my childhood. My people were sanctified brethren, big deal. <laughs> they. They were a little bit repressive, but I was used to it. <laughs> you know, there was, no, there was no dancing, there were no movies, no gambling, and, and, uh, and so forth. But, but, it, but they were very gentle people. My parents were deeply, deeply in love uh, with each other and had been ever since uh, my father borrowed his brother Bob's Model T, and, and he and my mother, two young unmarried people, went out and proceeded to become parents. Um, <laughs> the scandal tied them closely together, and they were sweet on each other for the rest of their lives. That was the home that I grew up in, the home of cheerful people, cheerful people who had weathered the Great Depression a time when you knew that all of the people around you were going through the same thing that you were going through. And so you didn't elaborate on your troubles. You didn't talk about them. You know what I mean? You didn't, you didn't you know, talk about how you were short on money or you were worried about, about how you'd make the rent uh, next Next, next month, because everybody else was in the same boat. And so your, your role in the kitchen there where everybody came and gathered around an oilcloth table and you sat and you drank coffee late at night, weak coffee, and you, and, you, and you talked, you told stories, your role was to be amusing and to be cheerful. My people believed in cheerfulness. Their theology was dark and miserable, but <laughs> they themselves believed in, in cheerfulness. And so I, without meaning to, fell into my parents' philosophy of life. I resisted it, but, I, but at the same time, I was... It was baked into me from the time I was a child. I got a job in radio uh, 
when I was when I was 25 years old, and I had gone off to New York the summer before. I had gone off to New York, um, wanting to catch on with the New Yorker magazine. I was in trouble. I was 25. I had a job that I that I despised, and and I was also engaged to be married to a young woman who was much more excited about it than I was. <laughs> and her mother, even more excited yet. It was going to be a big church wedding and with a reception at a country club, and there were going to be six bridesmaids in, in sort of bronze-colored silk outfits that uh, they would never, ever wear again. And, um, and I felt the closer we got towards fall on into June, July, I felt that this was a terrible mistake. But I did not know how to disappoint her mother. <laughs> At the same time, I had written a letter to my draft board back in Vietnam days a long letter, handwritten, ballpoint pen on yellow legal pad, telling them why I would not report for induction as they had ordered me to do. I had passed the physical, and, and so I was ordered to report to the federal building at 8 o'clock in the morning on a particular Monday, and I wrote this long letter saying why I would not. I don't think they were interested in why so much. <laughs> but I wrote it and I mailed it. And then it just felt like a good time to get in the car and go to New York. <laughs> I thought I could disappear in New York. I went to New York and I stayed at a rooming house on West 19th Street, uh, which was very, very cheap. It was, it was $65 a week, including breakfast and, and dinner. And uh, you just got a little room, bathroom down the hall. I had a room in the basement, a barred window looked out onto the street, a lot going on out there. Interesting for a Minnesota boy, I wrote it all up, notes, you know, trying to write something about street life that would interest the New Yorker magazine. I knew a guy in New York named Irwin who was a photographer by day, a taxi driver by night, lived with his wife, two infant daughters, fourth floor walk up, East Village. I went over there a couple of times. They lived in such squalor, such poverty, that I just couldn't imagine living like that. Plus which he was doing a lot of dope. He was doing LSD. He really was living on another plane. I tried to write a piece for The New Yorker. It got worse and worse the more I worked on it. It just got longer and longer and, and, and softer and softer and vaguer. And then I figured out that at The New Yorker magazine, they didn't really care that much about a Midwesterner's impressions of street life in a very poor neighborhood in Chelsea, and they just really weren't going to be interested. I took the bus up to Boston to apply at the Atlantic Monthly. I took an overnight bus to save on the cost of a hotel room. I arrived, I was about an hour and a half early for the interview. I went down the basement of their building and I, and I took off my shirt and I got some paper towels and liquid soap and I sort of gave myself a little bath there in the in the wash basin. About halfway through, a man came into the men's room and he stood at the urinal and made a point of not looking at me. <laughs> he was the man who conducted the interview and <laughs> it was polite and brief and, um, and he didn't urge me to keep in touch. And, <laughs> I got back on the bus and I went back to New York and I had to sell my car and get 
train fare back to Minnesota and back to get married. The draft board, for some reason, uh, never knocked on my door, nor did the FBI. I didn't want to know for a long time, and now I do, but I can't find out. <laughs> and so I applied for a radio job the next, the next year. I needed to earn some money. Always a quandary for an English major. <laughs> they hired me because I was willing to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, six days a week, drive to the transmitter, turn the transmitter on, go to the studio, and work the morning shift from 6 a.m. to 12 noon, and then do a 15-minute newscast. It had nothing to do with talent. I was hired because they thought I was a good bet to get up in the morning. <laughs> and that's how I started out in radio. It was an education because the things that you turn toward if you are a serious poet, despair, longing, alienation, are not useful when you're doing an early morning shift on the radio. <laughs> Your listeners have already experienced that. And so to share your own suffering with them is not useful. It's not what you're there for. You need to create a cheerful persona for yourself and, 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 and come to believe in it yourself. And so I did. And out of this cheerful persona, I created sponsors because it was non-commercial public radio. I created Bertha's Kitty Boutique and Jack's Auto Repair. All tracks lead to Jack's, where the bright flashing lights show you the way to complete satisfaction. And powder milk biscuits made from whole wheat that give shy persons the strength to get up and do what needs to be done. And, uh, and uh, all these others. And the Sidetrack Tap and the Chatterbox Cafe. And then I needed to have a town to put these sponsors in and, and so I came up just overnight with the, with the name Lake Wobegon, which has a kind of a vague Ojibwe sound about it and, <laughs> and has a double meaning in English and, uh, and bo both bedraggled and also, you know, woe be gone. And, um, uh, and in the same way, just sort of overnight, I came up with this catchphrase of, where all the women are strong and all the men are good looking and all the children are above average. <laughs> and uh, just trying to amuse people on winter mornings in Minnesota. <laughs> Necessity, the mother of invention, uh, you come up with something that though you don't know it at the time, is going to be your magnum opus <laughs> and, not, and not the trilogy you were sort of planning to write <laughs> about, about life on the barren plains. Isn't that interesting? It's so interesting to come <clears throat> to this age, to, the, to the, the scriptural allotment, and to be able to look back and to see your life and to see where it took a certain turn. It's just downright amazing to me uh, sometimes to, 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 to look back and to remember, to remember the summer afternoon that I was playing softball in the fifth grade out behind Benson School, and they put me out in right field and uh, the sissy position, and because uh, <laughs> everybody was right-handed, everybody was a pull hitter, and uh, I was out there, and you had a lot of time to sort of dream out in right field, and, uh, <laughs> and then suddenly here came a fly ball. It was not a hard fly. You just had to take a couple of steps in for it. 
but it bounced off the heel of my hand. I didn't have a glove, but neither did anybody else. And, uh, and it bounced off the heel of my hand. And the other team whooping and yelling and waving their jackets in the air. And, and, and my team just so crestfallen. And, and they wouldn't look at me when we went back into the school. I, I turned a corner there. And I asked Mrs. Molenbrock if in the future I could stay in the library instead of go out for recess. And she said, yes, because she believed I had this, you know, artistic talent because I was autistic. And she, uh, <laughs> and so your life takes this turn. And instead of trying to win the respect of your peers, you now turn your mind toward history, and it gets you curious to talk to your old uncles and ask them questions about the Depression and about, and about the war and, and where, they were, where they were during all of it. And to win the gratitude of your uncles is so easy compared to the respect of your peers. <laughs> They're so grateful that a boy shows an interest and they tell you stories and stories. I went out for football in the eighth grade or was going to and went to Dr. Mork's uh, clinic and he put his stethoscope on my chest and, and said, you can't play football because there's a, a click in your mitral valve so I can't sign your slip, which was, which was hard for about a day and a half. And then I went down to the paper, and down to the, the struggling weekly paper that was losing out to the big successful weekly paper. And I walked in the front door past the glass case that had all the wedding invitations in it, and I took a left turn into the editor's office, and I stood there, hat in hand, and asked him if he needed a sports writer. Well, he didn't have one, and he said, sure. And so I got to write up the football games for $2 a game and to sit up in the press box, <laughs> up, way up high above the bleachers. My friends, sitting down watching the game, turned around and looked up, and they waved at me, and I, being a professional journalist, did not wave back, but I, <laughs> I could feel their admiration. <laughs> I took my copy down to the offices to the linotype operators, Whitey and Russ, on, on Monday morning and handed them to them, these two confirmed alcoholics, pasty white faces, purple noses, sitting at the linotype, these enormous clattering machines to give off heat because there was a flame keeping the lead wet, soft so that you could pour liquid lead. They clacked out the letters on the keyboard and then pulled a lever and it poured lead in to make a line of type and down the slug it went and then they took it up and put it onto the chase and there was all of the, all of the hot lead there. And, and, and then on Thursday morning, you, I went down to watch them print the paper and Whitey, though he was drunk by noon, he was still able to stand on this wooden pallet and, and reach over to a great stack of newsprint and just loosen the top sheet, just flutter it a little bit. And then he would lift it up and drop it down perfectly on the flatbed press and the roller would come over it, whoosh, chunk, and the paper printed went into the folder which folded it and trimmed it up and down the chute it went and here you open it up and here on page 12 was my story with my name on it that, that gave a heroic account of a losing football game. <laughs> and, and, and hundreds, of, dozens of people would, would read this. <laughs> and you never get over this. You just never, ever get over this. All these little turns in, 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 in life. I got 
kicked out of shop class by Mr. Beeler because, because I was talking all the time. And I, I flunked ball peen hammer. I flunked plywood. I couldn't make a birdhouse. I, I was flunking sheet metal. I couldn't make a flower scoop. And then I violated a basic rule of shop, which was do not sit on the shop table, never. I did because I was talking and t telling somebody, and, and, and I sat down and there was acid on it, and <laughs> it burned holes in my pants so that they, they had to give me a shop apron to wear back, <laughs> back there, and, and they sprayed water on it, and, and Mr. Klonowski, the principal, got on Mr. Beeler's case, and Mr. Beeler said, you know, you just talk all the time, so I'm gonna send you up to speech class. And from the shop class with all the lathes and, and all the dangerous equipment, I went up to the second floor and into Miss Lavona Pearson's speech class where you stood on a stage and you looked out and you gave your impromptu speech as I'm doing right now and you, <laughs> except in bright light, and, uh, and, you, and you did not look in the eyes of your classmates because they were, they were crossing their eyes. They're, they're, they, they were pulling invisible skeins of snot out of their noses. They were doing everything they could to make you laugh. You, you looked at, at Miss Pearson, who stood in the back of the room and who gave you this, this beautiful, benevolent smile as if this was the most wonderful, wonderful impromptu speech by any 14-year-old she had ever heard in her life. This smile follows you for the rest of your life. Nothing you do for children is ever wasted. It just goes on and on forever. We'll never know. We will never, ever know. All of this good luck. And so, why would I want to write poems about my own despair? What I'm trying to say not very well, but trying, is that what is distinguished about us is not our despair, which is pretty much like everybody else's when you come right down to it. Loneliness is loneliness. Sorrow is sorrow. Yours, mine, everybody else's is pretty much the same. What distinguishes us are the things that make us laugh, that make us happy, the things that we, that we love. This is a basic philosophy of life. His wife said, please be careful. And he smiled confidently. I know what I'm doing, don't worry about me. So he buckled right in with a confident grin and his screwdriver touched a live wire. And he let out a cry and proceeded to die in a shower of sparks and fire. The people who gave the eulogy spoke of honor and love and ambition. They spoke well of the dead and nobody said, why didn't he call an electrician? <laughs> Oh, what a luxury it be, what pleasure, oh, what perfect bliss, how ordinary and yet chic to pee, to piss, to take a leak, to feel your bladder just go free and open like the mighty mist and all your cares go down the creek, to pee, to piss, to take a leak. For gentlemen of great physique who can hold water for one week, for ladies who one quarter cup of tea can fill completely up, for folks in urinalysis, for little kids just learning this, for Viennese or Swiss or Greek, for everyone, it's pretty great to urinate. <laughs> Women are more circumspect, but men can piss with great effect, with terrible hydraulic force, can make a stream or change its course, can put out fires or cigarettes, and sometimes laying down our bets, 
Late at night outside the bars, we like to aim up at the stars. <laughs> yes, for men it's much more grand. Women sit or squat, we stand and hold the fellow in our hand and proudly watch the golden arc, adjust the range and make our mark on stones and posts for rival men to smell and not come back again. <laughs> I wrote these poems, most of them for a Prairie Home Companion. Uh, I don't think anybody in public radio had done a poem about the beauty of urination before. And, <laughs> and so one does what one, one can to sort of broaden, you know, bro broaden the medium that you are, that you are in. To people raised in a railroad shack, it is known as your butt crack. To people who are more verbally deft, it is known as the gluteal cleft. Either way, it's at the bottom of your back between the one on the right and the one on the left. Some lady's swimwear of slender heft displays freely the gluteal cleft. On this matter, my mind is shut. Don't go around showing off your butt. Please desist at least until I am deceased. Your gluteal cleft, I must insist, should be seen by your dermatologist when treating a rash or cyst and nobody else. No daughter of mine wears thongs. That's the bottom line. <laughs> My daughter's 15 and... Uh, I did not send her that poem. I <laughs> was hoping she would just come across it <laughs> in the book. I did send her a copy of the book. I don't think she's cracked this book yet. <laughs> this is the fate of authors. Other authors talk about it. Our beloved children, the fruit of our loins, don't care to read what we've written. It's a, a bitter thing. Back in the day, my darling daughter, we didn't pay for a bottle of water. Back when Elvis was alive and coffee didn't cost $3.95. <laughs> Back then there was no internet. Google hadn't been invented yet. There were no chat rooms for us to go to. We just sat around and talked to people we knew. <laughs> Back in the day, there were no cell phones. When a man left home, he was left alone. Man didn't always feel so connected. He didn't walk down the street and get a call from Schenectady. <laughs> there were no seat belts and no airbags. You stood on the front seat next to your dad <laughs> as he drove along drinking his beer. Or you sat on his lap and you helped him steer. <laughs> I was autistic back in the day, but I didn't know it, so I was okay. <laughs> Had no shrink with a big black beard. People just looked at me and said, well, he's weird. And they <laughs> let me be. And for therapy, I spent all day in the library looking up stuff. I had no iPad, but I was a kid. And it wasn't that bad. Every fall, we went to the fair. We spent five or six dollars there. Always went to the stock car races, dropped ping pong balls in plaster vases, saw the fat lady and the Siamese twins, the penguin boy with a set of fins. I looked at my dad and deep in my soul, I couldn't believe I would ever be that old. I'm not nostalgic, my darling dear. I am very happy to be here. I just thought that you ought to know what it was like in the long, long ago. Well, 
Let me just close by saying that um, when you reach my age, you recognize your responsibility to, to try to keep the past present and to, and to maintain it in the face of all the wonderful things that have happened in our world that are new and, and, and that improve our lives. Nonetheless, we need to pay homage to the past, not so that we can avoid repeating it, but simply so that we know where we come from. Human sperm is very small, five microns, that's about all. It's just a cell with a dangly tail. Not as big as the ovum, but still you have to love them. And they're produced in the testes of the male. Beneath their shiny domes, they contain your chromosomes. And the tail can kick just like a leg. Nothing could be finer than to swim up a vagina <laughs> in search of a rendezvous with an egg. This is what we're here for as we get older is to, is to remind people where we, where we come from. <laughs> I, when I was a boy, I used to go to parades in Minnesota, and there was a man named Albert Wilson who was in the parade every year, every summer. He would, he would go by in a convertible as he got smaller and smaller and smaller in the back seat. He, he, lived to be 106 years old, and he was riding in parades until he was 103, and he was the last living veteran of the Civil War. There he was in that car going slowly down the street. Of course, he was a living survivor. A dead survivor would not have been carried out in public, but, uh, <laughs> but there he was, a sort of cadaverous-looking man with this, with this tiny, tiny hand, looked like the hand of an Egyptian mummy there, <laughs> being carried past a drummer boy in the 1st Minnesota Regiment. He'd been there at Gettysburg. He had, he had seen Abraham Lincoln marching. He had, he had marched down Pennsylvania Avenue when the Capitol was still being built. The dome marched down and the president sat in review of the troops. This man in this car in front of us had seen Abraham Lincoln. That's not a story. It actually existed. He saw it. He was there. And now I'm sort of the Albert Wilson of, <laughs> of, of our time and, and, getting, and, and getting more and more so. I'm, I'm one of the few people who can who can remember Gene Shepard on the radio. I'm one of the... Well, I've got some competition, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm one of the few people who follow Gene Shepard onto the radio. I remember when we cut tape, when we cut tape with a razor blade to edit radio shows. Hardly a man is still alive who remembers that famous day and year. And as I get older, I feel that the only proper attitude is gratitude. That rhymes, actually, doesn't it? I should use that sometime. I once imagined dying young, and then I did not. I, I, I got to be 40, which is too old to die young, and I have continued on since then. But you think back now to the times when you could have, when you could have. It was possible. It was offered to you, and you almost took it. And then you were born along a little farther down the road. The time when I drove south on Highway 52 from St. Paul on a cold February day, Snow was falling. There was a blizzard going on. There was a there was a there was a storm warning out. A storm alert out, and and no driving, no unnecessary driving. They said, on the radio that 
that morning, which of course is a call to arms for a Minnesota man. <laughs> it requires that you get your car keys and you, and you shovel out your car. Who's unnecessary driving? Me? No, no, no. I had to go down to the Mayo Clinic down Rochester for an MRI to figure out why I was having these headaches. And so I got in my car and I headed south on 52, this four-lane divided highway and heavy snow, blowing snow and, and, and driving fast because I was late. I was, I was heading south. I was, I was heading towards Zombroda and there was a semi on my left and, and we were making good time and, and the wipers were going and, and every so often there'd be a gust of wind and snow would come up and you were blinded for a minute, but we, but we kept on plowing forward. I was on the cell phone with my wife who was in Central Park in New York where the crocuses were coming up and she was talking about this and how wonderful it was and how she wished that I were there. And at the same time, I was trying to get a CD out of a CD player. <laughs> And I was trying to manage a cup of coffee, and uh, so I was kind of steering with my knees. And, uh, and we came over a hill, and the wind was blowing snow across the corn stubble, and, and it just, there was a drift there, and we came over it into the drift, and the snow just billowed up around us, this, this brilliant, white, blinding cloud of snow. It was like the rapture or something. And, and we drove into it, and, and, and I heard a long honk. And when we got out of this blinding snow, I was in the left lane, and he was in the right lane. <laughs> and we had switched positions, and he was not happy about it. <laughs> he gave me another honk. It was kind of a chastening moment. I reached up, and I fastened my seatbelt, and we... <laughs> continued on south to the Mayo Clinic and, and went to radiology for the appointment and they have you undress in a little room and you put on a gown for and a gown aft and onto a gurney you go and down the hall into this room with this enormous cyclotron in it and onto a little platform and up a rail. They, you, they, they run you up a rail and your head and your shoulders go into this machine for a half hour of wanging and banging and dinging and buzzing. And a neurologist showed me a map of my brain, which I never had seen before and hope never to see again. <laughs> And he pointed out two little spots. And that, he said, was where you suffered two small strokes and two blood clots came pumping up out of your atrium and there into your brain. And if they had landed just a millimeter up there, you would have major verbal and gross motor problems right now. You probably would not be walking. So there's the margin. There's the margin of grace, that little, that little millimeter. Instead of hitting a populated area, they landed in sort of the North Dakota of the brain. And, <laughs> and I went down to the cafeteria and I thought this over. I thought this over long, long and hard. If I had wound up in a ditch underneath 20 tons of truck, I never would have found out how <laughs> lucky I had been. I... <laughs> so, gratitude, gratitude. <laughs> I thank you for coming. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to open it up to some questions. I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you have a slip, 
the usher is going to come around and collect them, and I'm going to announce winner for free tickets at the end of the Q and A. Okay, questions? Okay, we're going to start here. Question over here. Oh yes, some years ago you moved for time to Denmark. What were you searching for? What did you find, and what did not you find? I thought I was going to become a, an American novelist, and uh, I was going to become a serious writer. And I sat in the, in the back bedroom of an apartment on Trondheimskjerde in Östervå in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen, and, uh, and I worked on a, on a swamp of a, of a novel that, uh, that uh, suffered from a lack of form and, uh, and, and a lot more. I remember uh, this, was, this was around uh, uh, 1988, uh, around the time the Soviet Union uh, fell apart. And this apartment on Trondheimskjerde was uh, just around the corner from the Soviet embassy. And one morning I was working on my novel and I heard people chanting in, in Danish. And, uh, and uh, Gorbachev must go, they were chanting, Gorbachev must go. Uh, and, 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 I, and I went outside and here was a crowd of old Danes, old Danish Marxists who loved being Stalinists in a free country and, <laughs> and who could not bear the thought that Gorbachev had opened the door to some sort of freedom in the, in the Soviet Union and they were chanting down with Gorbachev. It was so fascinating. It was more interesting than anything in my novel. And uh, I put the novel away. I, I was writing the novel on a word processor that was enormous, big as a suitcase. And that technology soon became obsolete. And there, I was writing it on an enormous floppy disk. And when it became obsolete, uh, I got a new laptop uh, that the, wrote on a smaller disk, and I never bothered ever to have that big floppy disk translated into uh, MS-DOS. Never bothered with it. It was just all a great mistake. And, uh, but good judgment comes from experience, and valuable experience comes from the exercise of bad judgment. So, we next next question. We get smarter by being dumber. <laughs> yes. So uh, now you're finally on a national tour with your poetry book. Well, so, national. I don't know. I mean, what? Portland, we're Seattle, pretty, we're, San Francisco. I mean, as far as us in the West Coast are concerned, that's national. Okay. <laughs> So is it anything like you imagined it would be when you were 25 years old? Is what like what I imagined it would be? Being on tour with your poetry book. No, 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 no. No, no. I, I've, I've been on book tours many times before, and it's, and it's, and it's wonderful. It's always been wonderful. You know, writing is, uh, is something you do in a small room uh, by yourself, and you gradually become tired of your own company. And... Uh, and uh, and, it, and it, so it's interesting to get out and, and, have, a, and have a look at uh, the people who are interested in what you're doing. Okay, next question over here on this side. Yeah. Hello, uh, thank you for talking with us today. That was great. Um, I think I might be the youngest person in this room by a few decades, but... Um, so is that Ira Glass? <laughs> <laughs> so my question is... Um, I write a little bit as well, and for me, it's always easier to write um, when I'm in a bad mood, I guess. Like, breakup well, poems are so much in a bad mood. So, you know, breakup poems are so much easier than like love poems because when I'm in a good mood, I want to, you know, be living and not be in a room by myself uh -huh. over a computer. Uh -huh. um, so, I guess my question is how do you find inspiration? Um, to write when things are going well and you want to be living, you don't need inspiration. Uh, writing is a, writing is a, is a, is a work habit, and you and you simply uh, and you simply go to work. A carpenter doesn't 
need uh, inspiration. A dentist uh, does not need inspiration. You, 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 you go to work when you're supposed to work. And, you, and it helps to have a deadline in my case. My deadline is, um, is the day after tomorrow um, <laughs> at 5 o'clock Central Time. And I will be you know, on a stage in a small theater uh, in Bemidji, Minnesota. And uh, where, where uh, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, is the first day of deer hunting season, um, a subject about which I know nothing whatsoever <laughs> and have even less interest in. But by 5 o'clock on Saturday, I need to have something interesting, hopefully funny, to say about deer hunting. And I promise you that I will. <laughs> I don't need inspiration. Fear, that's what you need, is fear. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have one more question, but before we get to that, I wanna announce the winner of the tickets, Barbara Good. Can you identify yourself? Yay, Barbara. Come see me during the book signing. I'll be at the, at the table. Barbara you... Bush is here? <laughs> Barbara Good. <laughs> Last question is right here in the middle. Oh, okay. <clears throat> You kind of let us hang uh, when you talked about uh, you got back to Minnesota and the woman was there and so forth. And yeah. you had, what happened to her? What happened to her? Well, she, she endured uh, being married to an ambitious uh, writer. And uh, the, the radio job that I got was a, a job at a radio station out in the country. And so she um, tagged along with me out to, um, we, we uh, rented a farmhouse um, out in the middle of German Catholic people who um, are very suspicious of strangers, especially a stranger with a beard and long hair. And, uh, and, and we lived out there in splendid isolation, splendid for me and not so much for her. Um, she had, we had a small child, and our first experimental child, and, uh, <laughs> and, she, um, and she, did her, she did her best, um, but, it was, but it was miserable uh, for her. I worked uh, a long shift at the radio station, and then I came home, and I sat down, and I wrote. I, I worked, I'm sure, um, 12 at least hours a day, maybe 16 sometimes. And um, uh, after, after a year of hard work, I got a creamy envelope from the New Yorker magazine and a letter from Roger Angel saying that they liked a story of mine and that they would, and that they would publish this. Um, and he sent a check uh, for $500. Uh, this was the biggest event in my life. I, I read that letter six times. It was not as big in my wife's life, <laughs> though she appreciated the $500. But for me, this, was, this made my life worthwhile. And she did not share that feeling. I couldn't really expect her to. So our lives sort of diverged at that point. We moved to the city because she just could not endure living out there in this, in this old brick farmhouse in German Catholic country near uh, New Munich, uh, Minnesota. And, uh, and so we moved to an apartment in the, in the city. And uh, I continued being uh, enormously busy every, every day and weekends as well. And we went our separate paths. It was, it was sad, but it was sort of inevitable. And that's what happened. I would make up a story if you wanted me to. I, <laughs> I can, uh, you know, I could, I could uh, make her queen for a day. I could, um, you know, have her win the living room suite and the washer-dryer combination. But, <laughs> but that's, what, uh, that's what happened. She, uh, we, we, uh, we divorced and she went into social work and there she found her true calling in life, which was to 
uh, represent people, to stand up for people who were old and who were confused and who, and who were being short, short-circuited by the system and, and, to, and to stand in government offices and to, and to uh, stand up and validate. I don't know, what's, what's the term I'm trying to... Advocate, advocate. advocate. She, she was a powerful advocate and, uh, and that's where she finally found her found her calling. Let me ask you one last question. Yes. Who's your favorite poet? My favorite poet? Well, I have a lot of favorite poets, um, um, but I guess uh, I should limit myself to one, shouldn't I? Um, I think a great American poet is Mae Swenson, uh, who was born uh, to a Swedish uh, Mormon family in Logan, Utah, 100 years ago, this year is her centenary. She was the oldest uh, child in a large family. She worked very, very hard helping her mother and father. She was a loyal, dutiful daughter. But when she was in her early 20s, she picked up and she moved to New York City. And she lived in Greenwich Village so that she could write poetry and also so that she could exercise her, her, own, her own sense of herself, which I think when she moved there, she understood included the fact that she preferred women to men. And so she lived a free life in straightened circumstances in Greenwich Village working as a secretary. She was enormously patient, and she created a fabulous body of work that uh, if, you, if you go to your library or your bookstore, you will find a Library of America collection of Mae Swenson all in one volume. And uh, if you have never read her before, I envy you having now the chance to read her. Read her. She was a beautiful poet, very funny uh, at times and erotic at other times. And uh, she really was... She really was amazing. It's a great American story of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a young person just pulling herself up, you know, and, and living the life she had, she had dreamed about. And may you do the same, and me too, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you.